Distinguished Senator from Hawaii. Thank you, Mr. President. Women and families across the country are confronting impossible choices because of Republican extremism on abortion. Do you risk your own health with a high-risk pregnancy, or do you risk being thrown in jail for trying to get an abortion? Do you stay in a state that forces you to carry for months a non-viable pregnancy to term? Do you travel hundreds of miles in secret to get access to a legal abortion in some other jurisdiction? If these choices sound awful, it's because they are. The chaos and the suffering created by Republicans is not just limited to red states. These attacks affect everyone. Take Hawaii, which legalized abortion over 50 years ago and has some of the strongest protections in the country. Yet there's a case before the Supreme Court right now trying to prevent people from accessing medication abortion by telehealth. That means if you live on an island like Kauai and rely on telehealth to get reproductive care, you'd have to take off work and get on a plane to access services. So if you're in a blue state thinking, I'm safe, you are not. Republicans are coming after all of it, and no one and nothing is off limits. Attacks on abortions threaten the entire system of reproductive care, including things like contraception, family planning programs, and early miscarriage care. Hospitals and doctors are terrified of providing care that will lose them or lic their license or land them in jail. For instance, if you're an OBGYN in a state like Texas, you might be forced to delay or deny treatment to a patient with an ectopic pregnancy because there's enough gray area that the state can arbitrarily decide that you broke the law and punish you for providing life-saving care. Doctors are not lawyers, and many in these states are understandably either retiring early or quitting or moving to a state that doesn't make criminals out of them simply for doing their jobs. I'm joined here in the gallery today by an OBGYN resident from Hawaii, Dr. Olivia Manayan. Born and raised in Honolulu, Dr. Manayan is a current chief resident at the University of Hawaii, and next year she'll begin her specialization in complex family planning, focusing on abortion training, complex contraception, and reproductive justice. We need more people like Dr. Manayan, not less. People who are passionate about providing accessible and equitable care to their communities. We ought to be celebrating their contributions, but instead Republicans are hard at work criminalizing the whole profession. Republicans are coming after all of it, and they are not going to stop. They've said what they're going to do, and now they are doing it. And I think the challenge for those of us on this side of the aisle is what they're doing is so bananas, it's so offensive, it's so cruel, it's so unpopular, that when we describe it accurately, it sounds like we are being hyper-partisan and freaking out for no reason. That's what it sounds like. I grant you that. But it's literally what's happening. IVF banned. Contraception, not sure. Ectopic pregnancy, you gotta carry that to term. Non-viable pregnancy, you gotta carry that to term and prove that it's non-viable. Even if your doctor says it's non-viable. The cruelty knows no end. So if you are a person who thinks, hey, you know, I'm kind of uncomfortable with abortion, and so maybe I think I'm pro-life, I want you to understand what it means to be pro-life in the context of this 50-year fight to eliminate women's control over their own bodies. They are not stopping at Roe. They are not stopping at IVF. They are not stopping at contraception. They are not stopping. They want to control people's bodies. Stopping all of this means fighting with as much coordination and passion as the anti-abortion movement has been doing for decades. And that includes men, too. This can't solely be a woman's issue. We don't get to sit this one out. These extreme policies affect everybody, and everyone wishing to start a family or caring for someone who's pregnant 
And so we all need to get involved. And when and if we have the House and the Senate and the presidency, we should enshrine all of these reproductive freedoms in federal statutory law. Mr. President, I ask consent that the following remarks appear in a separate part of the record. Without objection. Mr. President, the Senate will soon vote, how soon, unclear, but soon vote on an appropriations package which among other bills includes one from the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Subcommittee, which I chair. And I want to take a moment to talk about what's in it and why it matters so much. The United States is experiencing an unprecedented housing shortage. Homes are increasingly out of reach for so many families and individuals, and homelessness continues to rise to record levels. There's no question that the federal government must act. And no appropriations bill, especially one negotiated under difficult spending caps, demanded by House Republicans, is going to solve our decades-long housing problem. But what this bill does is provide funding for rental and homelessness assistance for millions of Americans. It also provides $100 million for the Yes in My Backyard program, which will incentivize building housing and eliminating exclusionary zoning policies that have long kept housing supply down. The bill also includes funding to modernize transportation and make it safer and more accessible. It fully funds the Federal Aviation Administration so that it can staff up and maintain a world-class air traffic control system. Also included is the funding for the Federal Railroad Administration, which in part will help to improve rail safety in the wake of the East Palestine trail derailment. Crucially, the bill provides vital funding to improve tribal housing and transportation infrastructure, including more than $1.3 billion for the Nahasda Native American Housing Block Grant Program. That's a record increase for tribal housing of more than $300 million, which will help tribes, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians build affordable housing in their communities and address their unique and urgent housing needs. As always, these bills are the product of a lot of hard work and patience, especially from our excellent staff. Uh, and that's been particularly true this year. They have worked so hard, um, long, long hours. Um, when we make a deal, um, the work begins. And whenever we decide that we have consummated our deal, they don't get to say, look, I'm in the middle of a kid's baseball game, or I'm at a doctor's appointment, or I'm on a run, or I just woke up. They have to get to work and draft the legislation. And so lots of them have spent a lot of sleepless nights. Um, my staff, the, the Republican staff on the T-HUD committee, um, our House counterparts, um, all of the people in leadership on both teams, um, everybody worked their butt off to make this possible, and I just wanted to appreciate them. I also want to take a moment to thank um, Ranking Member Cindy Hyde-Smith, the subcommittee members, as well as our counterparts in the House, Representative Cole and Quigley, who worked in good faith throughout the process to get us here. There's a lot more that we need to do to invest in housing and transportation around the country, but this bill funds enormously important priorities and projects so that, that so many Americans rely upon. And it's essential that we pass it along with the rest of the bills. We have a deadline of tomorrow night uh, at midnight, I am confident that we will make that deadline, uh, but we've got to uh, run this thing across the finish line. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and uh, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Baldwin. Aye. 